Hey guys, today we're finally doing the Q&A session for season one of Revolt Against the Modern World. So that's the first five episodes. And a while back, I asked people to send in questions if they had any, and I chose the ones that covered the topics that people either asked about the most, or that pertain to topics that could probably benefit from a little bit more clarification. And I hate long intros, so let's just get straight into the first question. So unfortunately, because it's been a while since I collected these questions and I was collecting them from a number of different places across social media, um, I didn't write down people's usernames or anything, but hopefully if you hear your question, you will recognize it as yours. And um, our first one, let me just pull it up on the screen here. Our first one is not so much a question as a request for some clarification, which I'm happy to do. So this person says, I think it would be helpful if you could delve into the meaning and content of metaphysics and what line of thought traditionalism follows, because I think it is a term that many people associate with spirituality, and it's not necessarily limited to that. Right, so um, metaphysics includes anything non-physical, and this typically gets equated with spirituality. So we have to define spiritual, and spiritual is just loosely the non-physical world. So anything we experience outside what our rational empirical senses tell us would be spiritual in some way. It's about a uh, connection or contact with something bigger than our physical reality. And the goal of tradition is to come into contact with the transcendent world, which is spirituality. You know, could you have that contact without it being about a religious pathway to a theological God? Yes, I suppose you could definitely have an experience of the transcendent and it not be framed as contact with God, but would still be spiritual. And one's definition of God could extend beyond the theological definition. You know, that said, that doesn't mean that it's about New Age woo-woo either. So that segues really nicely into our next question, which is one that a lot of people asked. And that is, how is Evola any different from New Age philosophy? I struggle to get past the woo-woo. Well, Whoever asked that, you are not alone. And it is something I've seen come up in the comments on the videos uh, fairly frequently as well. So it's, uh, I felt that this was a question worth tackling. And let's, um, let's dispel some misconceptions here. To answer this question, we first have to define what New Age is. New Age is about dabbling in all the fantastical elements of various traditions, like a person's at a buffet and only selecting the things they find most tasty but leaving behind much of the nutrition. So for me, that would be chocolate cake and not Brussels sprouts. Actually, I do like Brussels sprouts if they're cooked well, I take that back. So <laughs> the new age person never wants to go deep beyond the surface level feel good aspects of their philosophies, which makes it the perfect religion for the new world order because it allows its followers to be internally detached. It gives them a way to spiritually amuse themselves, but nothing more. Now, the difference with uh, tradition is that there are several schools of fully developed thought where the path requires a real effort and will challenge the person to grow and develop. With any traditional path, you have to put in actual work and there's no easy victories, no fluffy feel-good answers. So some aspects of tradition might be very appealing to New Agers, like the ones who quote the Buddha and put statues of him in their gardens, but it's ultimately just a fashion statement for them. To them, the Buddha was just this witty guy who makes them feel good, but as soon as Buddhism starts demanding genuine effort from them, they move on to the next feel-good thing. You know, contrast that to the monk who spends years in solitude mastering his mind, or the Shaolin warrior who works to master both body and mind to earn his stripes. So there's this prevalent belief within the New Age community that through the power of your own speculative analysis, you can arrive at some eureka moment where you can just expound on the nature of the universe and penetrate the veil of metaphysical reality. But that's like fool's gold. Just like Edison could not have invented the light bulb if he first had to discover electricity or lived in a cave scrounging for food, neither can we discover the path to the transcendent on our own in one lifetime. We need the pathways laid out by tradition to guide us there. The road is already paved for us. The new age person, on the other hand, believes we will all have our own subjective truth to discover, but tradition demands that we accept real truth even when it may be uncomfortable. New age is really a dead end because it doesn't, substant it doesn't uh, substantively go into any one tradition. 
It's like a psychological cheesecloth that only allows things to come through that stoke the ego and feed their narcissism or allow them to virtue signal over others. And it ultimately keeps them in their comfort zone. It filters out the ideas from traditional pathways that would push them forward and challenge them. So it's like it goes an inch deep into a hundred different perennial traditions, but never penetrates them or places them in a context that is consistent. Now, Evola is not positing or advocating any particular path. He is identifying what people believed for most of human history and in myth about the transcendent and the divine and the pathways that lead to transcendent knowledge. So it might seem like he's dabbling in a new age sort of way because he's not advocating a specific path, but that's not really his aim with this book. He's just aiming to discover commonalities among the different wisdom traditions that point to the transcendent truth. And then it's up to you to decide which path you would like to pursue to get there yourself. So this next question is one that I thought was very appropriate for this materially oriented modern world that we live in. And it's a point that comes up a lot in the comments. So I really wanted to address this one. This person writes, is it not fanciful to believe that there's a metaphysical world without evidence of such? How can one prove the existence of the metaphysical world? It is only the physical world that is empirically provable and therefore the only reality that exists. Prove me wrong. All right. So the reality of the metaphysical world, both its existence and its primacy is simply not reducible to discursive thought and therefore is not provable in a way that would satisfy the rational mind. The reason Evola touts the importance of the ascetic path is because only through acquiring actual experiential wisdom can one be satisfied. So let me give you an example to illustrate this. If I described Paris to you and showed it to you on a map and described in detail my visit there, it would not be the same as you actually traveling there and experiencing Paris in the first person. No matter how much you might believe another traveler's experience, there's a great gap, a chasm even, between what someone else tells you they experienced and what you experience. So there's no point trying to describe the metaphysical world to convince someone and instead the prescription is to set out on a path of open-minded discovery for yourself and in the process start developing incremental awareness of phenomena previously unperceived. And by doing so, gradually over time, one has the experience needed to provide the evidence. But without having experienced it yourself, you're merely trying to perceive something through the lens of someone else's insight and that's just never the same as things you've experienced yourself. So you don't need to already have a belief in the metaphysical to set out on an open-minded path of discovery. And that is what I would suggest to anybody who is struggling with that question. So the next question is, was Evola anti-Catholic? Um, this is another misconception that we need to set right. Evola was not anti-Catholic as such, but he did find it lacking in the sense that he didn't think it could be restored. The Catholic Church might be a good example of tradition in many ways, but that doesn't preclude it from having flaws or even fatal flaws. So um, Evola had relationships with a number of monasteries in Europe where they stored esoteric manuscripts that nobody else saw and that he was invited to read and translate. He was known as a multilinguist who had tremendous knowledge of such things and he would be invited to come and study these documents. And his view of Catholicism comes from an esoteric perspective. He's completely uninterested in exoteric forms of religion because the exoteric forms are generally not pathways to the esoteric. It's entirely functioning on its own simplistic plane and these exoteric forms develop because most people cannot understand the esoteric. And this gives them some way of grasping at the divine by way of analogies or metaphors to simplify the esoteric truths for people. So he's not even anti-exoteric, just indifferent. He would see the exoteric forms of religion as cultural trappings, and he just didn't find it very interesting. He was interested in having direct experiential knowledge of God, not merely some moral code to live by or a set of cultural practices to help avoid sin. So our next question is, for those who struggle with the esoteric, what value can they find in Evola's teachings? Um, also a good question. So the value really is in what Evola was trying to achieve. 
As you examine different spiritual paths, you would first encounter its exoteric form, and certain people will wish to go deeper and start looking into the mystery aspects of their religion. Any authentic spirituality should have a properly developed school of esoteric thought that provides a deeper nectar of truth for those who wish to go beyond the mere cultural window dressing of the exoteric teachings. One thing a person should first realize is that their own religion has much deeper layers to it. If you feel unsatisfied by your religion or you feel like something's missing, you might want to start looking deeper. But not everyone feels that way. You might feel totally satisfied by the exoteric form of your faith. And, you know, who's anybody to tell you that's not right? So whatever pathway you sh- that you choose, you should strive to be the best devotee of that faith that you can be and fully commit to it. And if you need more profound insight into your religious beliefs in order to do that, then you should approach the esoteric school of thought that your religion already has. Of those who do follow an esoteric path, there tends to be a mutual respect for others who have learned their own esoteric traditions. You you start to realize on some level there really is just one divine truth that manifests in many different ways. And if you can cut through all those layers and get to the roots, you find them converging. And that is what Evola was trying to achieve and specifically why he focuses on the esoteric. So next question. Does Evola have a definition of the afterlife and of the notion of a soul? Well, Evola usually talks about a huge range of topics and never intentionally injects his own opinion into it. Um, You know, his opinion might filter through just in terms of his interpretation or translation, perhaps. But um, if he's talking about, you know, Buddhism, for example, he will try to accurately represent what the Buddha actually said, rather than try to contort it and make it fit with his own beliefs. And in tradition, there are competing beliefs on souls and the afterlife. You might hear him talk about one school of traditional wisdom and steel man it so well that you think that that must be what he believes. Uh, But then you will find he can just as easily champion another school of thought as well. And even when he condemns the modern world, he does so in terms of what the world of tradition would have thought of it, not what he thinks personally. Even his autobiography doesn't discuss any details of his personal life, only the evolution of his thinking. But... An answer to this question might perhaps be found in his personal letters, um, of which I have not looked into. However, uh, I did do a bit of a search for it and I didn't come up with anything, but um, if you wanna go digging around yourself, let me know if you find the answer to this because it's a very interesting question. Okay, so our next question is, from episode two, can you explain more about what you mean about attaching our ego self to materialistic identifiers and why that is a hindrance? I think it was around the seven minute mark. Um, right, so first of all, let's define what ego self and materialistic identifiers are. The ego self is what we think of as our individual personality, uh, our little s self, as opposed to our transcendent capital S self. Materialistic identifiers are every type of category we would use to describe ourselves. For most people, those things become central to their identity and they're totally out of touch with their capital S self. The reason this is a hindrance is because it obscures truth from you. All of these ego identifiers are purely temporal and contingent. It is all the irrelevant condition aspects of your existence that will cease to exist when your physical body dies. These things are a barrier to ultimate truth rather than a pathway to it. And if you attach yourself to these things and believe that they are you, it obscures your ability to see your soul in its true state of being. All of these things are impermanent and will be washed away in time, and so they won't lead you to anything higher. And that's why it obscures your awareness of the transcendent reality of that which is. Now, some might raise the objection that uh, wouldn't detaching from the ego self lead to unhealthy self-erasure. That is the kind of thing you would expect to hear from modern psychologists who are themselves trapped in their own ego because they're not aware of the higher self except perhaps as an intellectual concept. Um, Psychologists on the whole tend to be um, very materialist and atheistic thinkers. Uh, So you could say that this is an erasure of the lower self so that you see your higher self. Um, That's one possible interpretation of the allegory of Plato's cave, actually. Instead of seeing only shadows, now you see true reality. Detaching from ego identifiers, though, can often lead to a moment of crisis. It's a frightening separation from the person's ego and the decentralization of their life around their conditioned existence. So, at first it can produce a scary feeling of vertigo. Uh, For example, the increased anxiety some people feel when they start a meditation practice. 
Um, you know, many people take up meditation uh, trying to alleviate their anxiety only to find that after they start getting into it, it makes their anxiety worse. Um, and this is, this is, you know, just due to the clearing out of, of all of these uh, trivialities of, of the ego from the mind. And so at this point, they can either face their emptiness at the loss of their conditioned existence or use that as an impetus to seek out something greater and more real beyond it. Or they might sink deeper into their ego consciousness and become hopelessly lost in it, just plunging deeper into samsara or a state of becoming as we talked about in a few of the episodes. They will want to aggressively reaffirm the importance of all their temporal aggregates. It's the spiritual equivalent of wanting to cut yourself to know you're still alive. Most people have all these useless, meaning, meaningless temporal traits that they attach so much importance to and they attach their whole identity to. And if they lose those things, they don't know who they are. Even though those, those things are basically lies and trivialities that don't mean anything in the bigger picture, uh, it's all they care about because it gives them a comfortable focal point of their lives, even though it's kind of a half-life because that person never has to grow or confront any of their real fears when they build up this idea that meaningless things are important. For example, consider a lower life form like a dog or a cat. My cat has this chewed up toy that is just about the most important thing in the world to him. And I, as a presumably higher life form, look at him and think, oh, that's pretty cute. He thinks this toy is so important and special, but you know, he's only a cat. He's not capable of thinking bigger than that. And humans do this too, just in a more complex way, like our jobs or our favorite sports teams. We have all these things that we believe are important to us and fill up huge amounts of our time. But even the most staunch materialists would have to agree they're pretty useless and, and silly in the grand scheme of things. And the amount of time we spend on this is time that we're not developing a spiritual life and getting in touch with our true capital S self, getting in touch with God and metaphysical reality. So this next question is from uh, episode three, and uh, this was another one that uh, a few people brought up. Throughout human history, so many nations have suffered under tyrannical kings. Why would you ever want to advocate for the monarchy when it has proved so disastrous? Correct, it has proven disastrous, and modern history is filled with examples of kings you would never want to serve. However, there's another side to the story. Myths and legends tell us, whether you want to believe it or not, that there have been sacred kings throughout the ages. Maybe not in modern times, but in times of antiquity. Most, if not all, royal lineages claim to trace back to a divine sacred king. But it can be acknowledged that it's an extremely idealistic view of human history that there was ever a golden age or that a sacred king ever existed, and so such an idea might be really hard for us to grasp today. But it's still relevant to note that this is what the world of tradition says. Across vast expanses of time, geography, language, culture, ethnicity, the same recurring theme presents itself. That there was a golden age, that there were divine kings, that we have not always been so dysfunctional. In many ways, it's easy to see how modern kings rode the coattails of these legends, as is deep in our collective unconscious that we, sh we should search for this type of transcendent leadership. Um, one could easily see a scenario where we could easily get ourselves in trouble by trying to seek out such a leader because it's not a situation where you take the best version of a man that you can find and then bestow all of this special status onto him like we do in democracies. Uh, that's what the British monarchy has done, paying lip service to these old ideals such as the infallibility of the king or whatever. It's very problematic when you choose a man for that role who falls far short of the mark. Instead, such a man would have to be of a different ontological nature and have it be thereby evident in the very nature of his being that he was different. And Evola is very clear on this. He would not need to persuade anyone to follow him because his ontological nature would be such that he would be obviously recognized as this. And if not, then it means he's not such a man. So Evola is not arguing that we should become monarchists in the Kali Yuga, and he does note problems with modern kingship. He is merely explaining what the world of tradition believed about kings, and it's up to us to reflect on what that means for us in our modern age. Evel is not addressing political solutions in this book. I cannot stress that enough. He's not advocating for any particular form of government or policy or action that we should take in the material political realm, and readers of this book should definitely keep that in mind. Somebody wants to say hi here, it looks like. Hello. Want to say hello? 
Look at that cute face. You want to answer the next question? You want to sit here with me? All right, so our next question. <sighs> Move your face from the mic. Julius Evola and his mentor, Rene Guinan, both wrote about hierarchical class caste systems in several of their respective works, though they differed in their belief in which of the castes should be considered worthy of holding leadership positions. Evola believed soldiers should lead society, while Guinan followed the more orthodox thought of it being the priests. Which do you believe was the correct interpretation of the two and why? Well, this guy thinks that hunters, warriors should rule the world. You think you're the boss around here, don't you? Go on, go somewhere else. <laughs> um, so the answer would depend on what era we're talking about, I think. If the priestly caste had become extremely corrupt and had lost the efficacy of the right, uh, which is something we'll be discussing in episode six coming up at the end of the month, then maybe it would be best to have the warrior caste ruling in such an era, such as in the Silver Age. Um, to say who should be ruling is more like saying who is best suited to this particular age. If we had a true champion of the warrior class, then let him lead and build a new aristocracy around him. But if a great prophet or mystic were to emerge, then rally around him. My feeling is that the priestly caste is better in principle because of the transcendent connection that they're supposed to have, but, you know, that's not always how it plays out in practice. Would you have warriors leading a society where the priestly caste is non-existent? There would likely be an active relationship between the priests and the warriors, I think. The priests might write much of the propaganda that motivates the warriors, and they might recognize the primacy of the warriors in that era and then work to uplift them. You need one to be advising the other, but that would require that there be a priestly caste that did have some ritual efficacy left. But if the priestly caste were in charge, they would still need the warrior caste unless their spirituality was so overwhelming that no physical force could harm them. So each serves a role and those roles are very important and each needs to be fulfilled. If not, something's lacking and that would be to the great detriment of all society. You don't want to just have a warrior caste that has no spiritual grounding at all and is just merely focused on the physical material struggle. They need the grounding principle of spirituality. I talk more about this interdependence of the warrior and the ascetic archetypes in a video called Traditional Man's Path to Heroism, which I'm sure many of you have already seen, but um, I do go into it a little bit more there. So our last question here is kind of a three in one and it was, um, it was a topic that came up quite frequently. So uh, I wanna end with this one. How can one best put these traditional ideas into practice in their daily lives? What specifically can we do to live these values? Do you recommend a specific religion? You know, we live in an age where there's this postmodern thrust to make everything so progressive that the entire world of traditional beliefs gets washed away, that the whole ball of wax is viewed as outdated and disproven. But as the world becomes more and more progressive and there are more and more subterranean currents influencing this frenetic urge towards progressivism, through that we see all the principles of the past constantly being eroded before our very eyes. And what progressivism stands in opposition to is these sets of traditional beliefs, which have all been under attack by modernity for a very long time. Whether it be traditional beliefs about man and woman, the importance of initiation and ritual, the structure of society around a sacred king instead of a democracy, principles of hierarchy, devotion to God, and so forth. And in many ways, what is being articulated in Revolt Against the Modern World is like an idealized memory. So people often want to know how to take this memory and use it in a practical way. And the answer is, you really can't. The time is past for these things right now, but they do offer us a compass to understand what the people of the past thought about these subjects, and they offer us ideals to strive for. It's very hard to defend tradition if you don't even know what it was that tradition believed or why. So it's valuable, valuable for us that Evel is laying out these ideas so that we can avoid having our memories wiped in effect. But in terms of how to put it in practice, there are chapters later that deal with a discussion of things that are more imminent to the individual and daily life, but we haven't gotten to those yet. These chapters are more just about what the world of tradition believed. So the most important thing to put into practice is the realization that first and foremost, the metaphysical world is the real world, but this world is a reflection of that. Of course, this world is real too, but tradition teaches the concept of duality of nature and the world of spirit upholds the world of matter. 
For a lot of people, this realization alone can change their orientation away from focusing on hedonism and consumerism and towards building up spiritual riches instead. This would change how you live because it changes what you see as important and that changes how you choose to allocate your time and resources. The concept of time that Evola lays out in these early chapters can cause you to have more faith in the metaphysical world because you'll no longer feel like this is the only existence and that there is a divine fabric that upholds this world and is one of supreme order. When we see this world and its extreme chaos and are frustrated by it and by its lack of meaning, you know, it can help us find our true nature and, and true meaning and it can help us find new ideals to orient towards. It can help us make sense of what's happening around us, for example, you know, why we feel underwhelmed by our leaders or questions like, what's wrong with this world? What is, what is the proper way society should be structured? What does it mean to be a man or a woman? What is our true nature yearning for? These things resonate in our collective unconscious. All of this is illuminated by how we view these subjects in history. And Evola goes on about abstract concepts like space and time and what our leaders should be and what our laws should look like. And all of this is illuminated by an understanding of tradition. And when we have that, we come to understand what is wrong with the world and what would need to happen to make it right. So now you know what star to aim for. Even if you know you can never reach it, you aim high and achieve a lesser but still transcendently oriented goal. And even if you say you're a progressive and hate tradition, at least you can fully understand what it is that you are rejecting. But to blindly stumble through history without any understanding of this is just simply not healthy. As to religion, this really depends on the individual, uh, their inherent nature, what resonates with them the most. Um, some might be better to pursue Christianity, some may be better to pursue Buddhism or another Vedic path, uh, maybe Zoroastrianism, maybe one of the ancient European faiths. But whatever religion you choose to pursue, you should be open to the esoteric teachings of other religions. So for example, the European pagan traditions lost many of their metaphysical teachings that can still be found in Vedic literature. Whatever you choose, as I said before, be the best devotee that you can be. But don't be dogmatic about it. Adhere to your chosen pathway as strictly as possible for yourself, but don't close your mind off to other sources of truth. The religious practice is just to help keep you away from sin and keep you focused on God. Too many people make the mistake of becoming close-minded and dogmatic with their faith and reject wisdom from any other source. And instead of focusing on their own spiritual life, they expend far too much energy trying to proselytize to others. Your job with religion is to focus on keeping yourself away from sin and in connection with God, not trying to convince everyone else to believe what you do. You know, let other people explore their own path and relationship with God on their terms. So yes, in terms of religion, it, it really depends on you and what resonates with you and what you personally find fulfilling in terms of, you know, what you're looking for on, on that pathway. I hope this answers the questions you guys had and we'll definitely do this again after season two. Well, hopefully <laughs> we'll be releasing the next episode sometime this month. So keep an eye on my social media posts and we'll announce a date soon. I know it's been a long wait and we just want to thank you guys for your patience as well as your support and kind words. You want to say, you want to say goodbye? Say thanks for watching. No, you saw something out the window. All right. See you guys later.